More than 5 million Americans are admitted to hospital intensive care units, or ICUs, each year. Undoubtedly, they are a crucial component of the health care system for treating seriously ill patients and preventing deaths. But some patients also eventually leave the ICU with new complications and problems. Special correspondent Jackie Judd looks at those concerns in an effort to make sure patients are getting the right interventions. Well, as soon as this ultrasound is done, we're going to get your lights on and your windows open, okay? Every year, almost six million patients land in an intensive care unit, and through often heroic efforts, lives are saved. For many of those survivors, that period of time becomes a bright line in their lives of before and after. Now, I am very aware that my, I am not the same person that went into the hospital with sepsis. I, I, I am just not. In what ways? Well, my personality, I'm, I'm shorter tempered, mood change, mild depression. Paul Turpin, an endocrinologist who lives outside of Nashville with his wife Mary Lou, spent a month in an ICU. That was two and a half years ago. Hey, we met once before at the luncheon. Richard Langford's first ICU stay was a decade ago, and he has not lived on his own ever since. Mom is the one who takes care of me. Now, my mother is 88 years old. The, the challenge is. Psychologist Jim Jackson leads this support group and is part of a team at Vanderbilt University Medical Center that helped identify a constellation of symptoms mimicking PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. They call it post-intensive care syndrome, or PICS. They don't have a traumatic experience in the way that a combat veteran or a rape survivor would, so they're not referred to a mental health professional. They really fall through the cracks. With all of these gaps, there just is a lack of awareness. How do you feel? Dr. Wes Ely has studied this phenomenon for almost 20 years. He says the risk factors are clear. Powerful sedatives and prolonged use of ventilators, which can trigger delirium. Some ICU patients need those interventions, but not all of them do. We had to tie people down so they wouldn't pull lines and tubes out, but we also chemically restrained them with these deep sedatives. So we got comfortable pummeling people's brains with gargantuan amounts of benzodiazepines, propofol, and other types of, of sedation. We put them in this cocoon, uh, but it wasn't a safe one. And when, in, when we started measuring delirium and then started measuring physical immobility, it unveiled this issue of PICS. Hey, sweetie. Can you open your eyes? Yeah, a substantial point. number of patients leave the ICU with newly acquired problems, ranging from dementia to depression to muscle and nerve disease. Dr. Ely has been following some of them for six years and will soon release a study. Preliminary data show one-third of patients improve and get back to normal cognitive and functioning levels. One-third remain the same as the day they left the hospital, and one-third decline even further. We should talk about whether we shouldn't move the tube to the neck, okay? Because that will allow us to decrease the amount of sedation that you're on. So leaders in acute care developed a different ICU treatment. When possible, they keep patients out of the cocoon by reducing the use of drugs and ventilators and by getting patients moving. Turning off of sedation every day and turning off the ventilator every day gets people out of the hospital sooner, it decreases cost of care, and it helps improve survival. Hospitals around the country have been slow to adopt the practices in use here at Vanderbilt. It's been more than four years since the Society of Critical Care Medicine issued new treatment guidelines for controlling pain and delirium in the ICU. And yet today, the organization describes compliance as mediocre. We're going to get you every day up as much as we can, okay? Coaxing patients out of bed to exercise takes a lot more staff time than sedating them. And getting doctors to change what has long been done is hard. A lot of it has to do with people in long white coats, the doctors. The doctors are used to how they do things. They don't want to be told to do it a different way. And they're late adopters. 
You know, we have early adopters in life, we have late adopters. And the doctors think, well, you know, this is an invisible problem. I don't see it, I don't see it as an issue anyway. They can't even necessarily envision what it is that could happen so much better. Hi, Mr. Peters. Hello. How are you? Good. Vanderbilt Good. used to release patients from the ICU with no follow-up. Now it is one of a handful of hospitals with post-ICU clinics. It's a way station for patients at risk. The goal is to be a bridge to a medical world with little awareness of the syndrome. Mm -hmm. Dr. Carla Sieven is one of the founders. The main purpose of the clinic is to sort of bridge this million dollar intensive care time to this um, outpatient status, which is not set up to take care of the multi-pronged uh, problems that people ex experience after the ICU. That might be permanent. Right. The clinic also organizes the support group where Richard Langford is a regular. It helps give me a structure for why I'm feeling the way I do and that I'm, I'm not going crazy. This anxiety is, is not something that will kill me. It's not something that I have to worry about and keep worrying about worrying about worrying. Thank you, Lord, for this nice day. As for Paul Turpin, he is happily back practicing medicine and still managing emotional ups and downs, including a lingering sense of terror, which is common among ICU patients. Fear of ever being in an ICU. What is the fear rooted in? Being back in those circumstances, being out of control, being wrapped up in that cocoon. Is it what you fear the most in your life at the moment? Probably. You know, you, you are an inspiration to us. Dr. Ely, who travels worldwide to spread the word about PICS, says he senses a momentum to shift ICU care in order to reduce the harm it can cause. People were built to be vertical and moving around, not lying in a bed 24-7. So we're trying to get back to the humanness of critical care. Can you look to the left now? Even so, he predicts it will be at least five years before what happens in this ICU becomes the norm for patients being treated at the most vulnerable and frightening time of their lives. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Jackie Judd in Nashville, Tennessee.